I, indifference is one word for it, but I think what is so striking to someone on the outside of this is that I'll, there's a reporting today that on January 6th, McCarthy is on the phone with President Trump saying they're trying to effing kill me. This is someone who's terrified for his own life. And then in the subsequent days, can't acknowledge to you or publicly what happened that day. I mean, is that a difference or is that aiding and abetting someone who is trying to tear down democratic institutions? I, I guess I just wonder if I would describe more nefarious um, motives to someone who so clearly understood the stakes that day, the danger, the peril, um, not just individually, but to the country, and then in the month since has done anything but lead on the issue. I mean, I, I would describe it as that. I, I don't know if it rises to the level of you know, criminal culpability. And I'm not suggesting yeah, criminal culpability, but, but... Certainly, you know, there's a moral and ethical obligation that I believe that our uh, politicians have. Uh, and, you know, Kevin McCarthy has failed to meet that threshold, I think, time and time again. Um, it's disappointing. Did it, but did any of it shock you after you left those meetings, effectively having failed in your quest? Uh, I don't know if I failed in my quest necessarily with those events. I mean, I went there. Uh, I met with Kevin McCarthy. I had an opportunity to uh, to speak with him. I recorded that conversation. Yeah. Um, and I was able to expose, you know, elements of his indifference. And, you know, what I saw is a, a calculated approach to mm -hmm. the events of January 6th. Like, let me assure you, um, and there's a lot, there's people out there that are much better versed in, in Kevin McCarthy than me, but Kevin McCarthy really wants to be Speaker of the House. Yeah. And he will do anything to be Speaker of the House. Um, you know, he's not concerned about his legacy. Uh, he's only concerned with uh, retaining power and, and obtaining that position. And so what he did was, you know, in the immediate aftermath of January 6th, he saw it for what it was. Mm -hmm. He voiced that, vocalized it on the House floor. And then when he realized that it was going to be uh, politically disadvantageous to stay that course, he reversed course, went down to Mar-a-Lago, kissed Trump's ass. And now we're seeing, you know, a very different approach to uh, what January 6th was from him and the rest of the uh, Republican Party. Uh, yeah, I mean, the polling on this is shocking that the Republicans on whole are more prone to believe that January 6th was legitimate protest today than they were previously. And that said, and it's a combination of you've got Fox News pumping propaganda out, downplaying the, you know, the reality of that day. Uh, and then you also have uh, elected representatives in Congress and in other political positions going back to their constituents and telling them things like Andrew Clyde saying it was a tourist day. Um, you know, I forget his name from Wisconsin, the uh, uh, senator there, Ron, saying, Johnson. Ron Johnson, saying that, you know, he, he keeps engaging in this debate about what an armed insurrection is. Well, I mean, I hate to tell you this, Ron Johnson, but there were firearms there. There were guns there. It's a fact. Uh, you're going to have to get over it and accept the fact that this was an armed insurrection in whatever sense that you describe it as. Yeah. But there were guns, period.